What if I stumble? What if I fall? Is failure an option? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Church Media Guys Show. My name is Dave Curley, and if we've not met, I am the founder of ChurchTrainingAcademy.com, which is a website where people like you and I come together to learn how to use and exploit media and technology so that we can take the gospel to the world. Our feature presentation is a discussion that Justin had uh, in one of our mastermind groups. One of the things that we talked about last night was about failure, and Justin had some thoughts, and he said, you know what, I just want to kind of throw this out, I want to share this and get some feedback. And so, of course, I recorded it, and then we were talking this morning, and Justin is under the weather, and he said, you know what? That was a really good thing that we were talking about last night. Why don't you share that with the show? So that's what our show is today, is talking about failure, talking about, um, talking about I think, uh, the mindset of failure and, and trying to make sure that we as the, 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 the media professionals, we as the... Um, the whether you're leading the ministry team or whether you're a volunteer uh, on the ministry team, and being able to foster an environment where it's okay to fail, but you want to fix and iterate and move on, that kind of thing. Justin has some really interesting thoughts in there, and so I'm, that's what we're going to be sharing here in our feature presentation in a few minutes. And now for our feature presentation. This is going to make me sound like a weirdo or a genius. Okay. It's probably going to be a weirdo. Sometimes I just talk in the shower like I'm giving a speech. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You like know I practice just, like... I love you, I pract- you sweet thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I practice like if I was to make an argument for something or if I was to give a speech on something or sometimes I just talk to gather my thoughts um, because I try to explain something. And I can't explain it unless I get it wrong a few times. Hmm. And then I find me like, oh, that's how I need to explain it. So are you like mumbling uh, to yourself or are you like looking no, at the washcloth like talking? talking? Like, I'm actually like talking out loud. It's easier because no one's here. It's just me this week. Right. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's actually talking like as if I was giving a speech. Okay. I like guess if I was talking to someone right in front of me, very verbose. Uh, and I kind of just gather, I kind of just... I don't know. It's, you know, it's the whole thing where like your brain just works better in the shower because you're not really yeah. thinking about anything. So I just start talking yep. uh, and, I, and I work on like how I would say things or how I would introduce myself to people. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start something. I kind of started talking about school uh, because I've been talking about school actually a, a lot lately, uh, especially when we talk about college, like Jill's college. Um, and it kind of evolved into like, huh, this might be a pretty good little uh, teaching moment for CTA. Um, now, I don't know if anyone here can use this information, but certainly someone someday can find it in the Insiders uh, archives and hopefully get something from it. So All right. um, let me let me start with this. So a, a, a disagreement I get into often, and, and I got it, I get it from all sides of, yes, I agree with you, or no, you're crazy, uh, is when I tell people that, higher education specifically is going to look very different by the time my daughter goes to college in 13 years or what would be 13 years. Um, right now it's pretty much expected. You go to school, you get free money from the government, you get your degree and you go out and find work. The problem is, is that everyone's getting degrees um, and they're pretty much getting degrees and either figuring out this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life or the money's free flowing. So let's go get another degree or change what I want to do halfway through. You know, they always say, you know, freshmen's uh, I think when I went to college in 2006, seven, they told me um, it's normal to change your major two to three times. And I was talking to my wife first and I said, uh, we were talking about her school and I said, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do until I was almost done with college, almost done with a four-year degree that I, that I so easily turned into a five and a half year degree. Um, I was, I was probably 21, 22 by the time I figured out what I really wanted to do. My wife uh, went, went to undergrad a pre-med and by the time she got out of school, she was so burned down on school. She did not want to do pre-med. So she went right into the, went right into the workforce rather than starting to apply for medical school. Uh, and then she found out she didn't want to be a doctor after, uh, being out of school and, and kind of being in the actually working in a hospital environment first as an EMT, then as a lab tech, she discovered that she didn't want to be a doctor. Doctors have 
to worry about too much and they don't see the patient often enough. And that's when she discovered she wanted to be a physician assistant because they actually have more time with patients. Um, and, but her, myself, and, and countless others that have similar stories of they go to school, they get a degree, but then they get a job they actually want that doesn't use the degree. And I think it's because we've developed this systemization of uh, school is about standardization, memorization, and then right after that's done, you got to go back into school because other people are going to, into school. So that's more competition. Schools don't want you after you after you graduate and you wait two years, it's harder to get. So you got to go right into school. You're forced to pick something. I say this all the time with as much love and respect out of my heart as possible. Uh, I went into music ministry because I knew I was called to ministry, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And everyone just said, you're good at music, be a music pastor. So I went to school and I got a, I got a degree in church music. Um, but like I said, it wasn't until three or four years later that I discovered what my real passion and what I believe my real calling is, is, is media ministry uh, and, and design ministry. And music uh, laid a good foundation for that. And uh, I'm very thankful for my music degree. But if I had had some time to figure out what I want, or maybe if I had a little bit more leeway of testing out different things, trying different things, I might have figured something out a little bit earlier. And granted, this was at a time when media ministry was still kind of being birthed into mainstream ministry. Um, but, you know, so we got on the conversation of school and how, A, um, we were really pressured to make a decision because um, even if you make the wrong decision, you have to finish because failure is not an option. Uh, the other issue, too, with school right now that I see is it's not building towards the future. Um, for example, when I was in school and probably when y'all were in school, Dave, maybe you can tell me, um, we had to learn the presidents, right? We had to learn the capitals of every state. Um, we had to learn how to do math without a calculator. All that is rendered pointless because of this device that we have in our, I mean, everyone has a phone. Even the homeless people that sit outside the grocery store have a, have a phone. Um, it's, it's being rendered useless. It, it's not about memorization. What we've really done is we've taken standardization and memorization across all the schools and we've made that the key component to success. And we've taken away what I believe is critical thinking. And this is why Jill is in private school. Um, this is why I believe uh, certain parents that teach their kids critical thinking, their kids are more successful because they don't rely on the school to do that because the school is all about memorization. It's about knowing who the presidents are. It's about knowing how to do math without the calculator. Uh, no, one, no high school I know of standardized teaches how to do your taxes or how to do appropriate financial responsibility. They don't teach that. They teach other stuff that you have to memorize, formulas and facts and science and stuff like that. I think all that's important for certain people, but where, where it really comes down to is the fact that you have to memorize something, and if you don't, that you fail. You fail at life. So um, we're told that we have to play this game of memorization and that we get an A or a B in that, a passing grade, and that's going to help us succeed in life. But that's not what helps us succeed in life, I believe. What helps us succeed in life is critical thinking. It's thinking under pressure. It's adapting. It's modifying our approach. It's learning from our mistakes. And the problem is that in schools, we say that you, you need to be successful. You just need to know some stuff. And if you don't know it, you're not successful. But in everyone that I've met that I would call successful, it's not because they memorized or they know so much. It's because they're really, really good critical thinkers. And here's the key. This is where it wraps into church media is that they've been able to move past failure. And this is where I think school, especially in my generation, has failed us is that, first of all, um, we, we, we don't really know what failure is uh, because if we get a failing grade, we're assisted in that memorization so we can kind of move past it. Um, but we didn't really we didn't really do it on our own. We always had assistance. There was no put your head down and cram and memorize. It was always with assistance. And so when we, we did fail, we had people there with us, but we really, really didn't know how to fail on our own. Um, in fact, in my own growing up, uh, I actually was grounded if I got a C. So we had progress reports, which was halfway through report cards. If I had a C in my progress report, I was grounded. And two times I got C's on actual report cards. And um, that was very disappointing to my parents. And I was grounded for the entire next six-week period until the next report card. Um, so even a C, below a C was failure. It was not an option. And so because of that, because it wasn't okay to fail, because it wasn't this, I've always been afraid of failure and I don't know how to cope with it. 
Um, because when the going gets tough, I choose to just not try. And that's kind of where a lot of my generation, and, and I think there's some of this in every generation, where we become so afraid of failure because we haven't learned how to deal with it because we've been made promises that aren't able to be kept because we've been told in school, hey, if you just put your head down, memorize what we tell and, and do what we tell you, you'll be successful in life. But life is way more beyond than what just memorizing some facts in school. Like I said, we don't learn how to do banking and 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 middle school or high school. We should have that. Um, we, we don't learn basic life skills a lot. We have a health class. Uh, that's kind of pointless nowadays. Um, it's basically, you know, be careful having sex class. And here's kind of some diseases that non, non STDs that you might see, or, you know, some other health factors of whatever dieting, nutrition, um, that that's kind of important. But anyways, so what I'm getting at is Oftentimes, I've seen in volunteers of all ages, but specifically younger volunteers, um, and and I think Gen Z is getting a little bit past this, but we're, they're not there yet. Is that we either we only want to do something because we know we can do it, and what that often means is that we take the easy road. So uh, we'll live stream to Facebook. Yeah, great, awesome. Hey, can we do a little bit more? I want that. And if I try, I might fail. And, uh, you know, um, I don't think that's going to be okay. Or maybe we find some documentation that worked for someone and we say, great, I can try that. And then we try it. But because it's written down that it should work and it does not work on our screen, we feel failure because we don't know how to critically think outside of that situation. And for those of us leaders in church media, I think to evolve into that leader we have picked up, or naturally have some critical thinking from either uh, what God's given us through birth or from the mentors we've had. But our volunteers that we're building up have probably, possibly not developed those critical thinking skills. And so they're afraid to take action. They're afraid to take steps. They're afraid to try something new. They just want to sit there and push the buttons and be happy and feel good about themselves. So what I want to encourage you today is A, absolutely, absolutely, uh, as part of your training and as part of your continuing education, um, you know, challenge your volunteers to be critical thinkers. And of course, you want to reward and praise them or, or correct them if, if they, they get the answer wrong. Um, but one of the things that we routinely did for our uh, sound, our youth volunteer sound engineer was I would just go up and I would just mess with some dials or I'd press the, the tape deck button that just muted everything. I don't know what it, why it did that, but I knew there was one button it said tape something uh, and it would just turn everything off on the board. I think I just took everything into a different output. And I would say, what's wrong? And he would kind of, he would kind of look at it and just kind of like, uh, and then, and then he would, and then I, the first time I showed him, I was like, Hey, I just clicked this button. I don't know why it doesn't work, but that's a button that you can now check from now on. And I tell you what, one day the sound wasn't working. And I was like, Josh, what's going on? We, we have a guest band coming and he found that button. And he said, Oh, someone bumped the button. And he learned that because because I had taught him either A, this is something that you need to check, or B, it's not the same every week. You need to critically think what's different, what's changed, uh, you know, what button is different, what knob is different, and kind of brought him up. Uh, granted, he was only like six years younger than me, uh, but I brought, was able to bring him up to critically think about how to fix situations when they go wrong. And on the flip side, it's okay to fail, okay? And this is where it really gets hard as leaders because we want to see success. And we don't want to give projects or, or ideas or things to people because we know they might fail. But that's a risk that we take in building leaderships. I failed a lot when I was a youth intern. I planned some terrible games. I did some bad youth uh, Bible studies. I sang some crappy songs. Uh, I played some wrong chords. I remember one time a worship set went so bad, I was sweating bullets, after, like literally sweating bullets in the middle of it. It was just... It was terrible. It was awful. I failed. Um, but through that, our youth pastor, my boss, coached me through um, why, what, what didn't go well. I mean, first of all, like, I want you to do a good job and, and we need to use this as a learning opportunity. Um, and yeah, that sucked. You did a bad job. You dropped the ball. You didn't plan it right. You got too frustrated. You got too stressed. You got too sweaty. I don't know. To figure, but he helped me, you know, find the things that made me uncomfortable, um, and and challenged me to do that. So when you're building up your own church media team, the, finally the big the big idea here, when you're building up your church media team, 
you want to look for those critical thinkers. But if someone's not a critical thinker, you really, if you want them to be the future of your church's media, you need to teach them and, and rear them up to be critical thinkers. Because we all know that not everything, even though all the settings and knobs and buttons are the same, there's always gremlins in our in our sound booth every week that messes with something in the cabling or yeah, you know maybe one wire comes out so you know the, teach them the troubleshooting steps teach them the routing teach them how to fix it um, you don't have to do everything at once but to over time and then if they fail encourage them in the failure let them know it's okay like I failed a lot too I did the same mistake I did a worse mistake but I'm still here and I'm better for it so yeah, you messed up because um, you turned the lights on. You you leaned over and you turned the light, all the house lights on in the middle of Good Good Father. Like yeah, that was awkward. That's kind of funny now thinking about it. But now you know when you're leaning over to look at some cabling, your stomach might hit the button that turns all the lights on. So you know, be more careful next time. Be more aware of your surroundings. Or what can we do to prevent that? Well, maybe we can move the light board back, you know, a little bit of critical thinking there to really build up the church media team because they're the future, especially if they're younger, um, because we're not always going to be there. God's going to call us to other churches. God's going to call us to other ministries. God's going to call us home. Um, and then they're the future. So really invest in them because I believe the school is not teaching that critical thinking, uh, at least not when I was there. Maybe they changed it in the last 10 years, but the, so if if there's no critical thinking being taught, then they basically need their hand held uh, throughout the whole process. And if it doesn't work, they're going to freak out and not know how to fix it or just not want to even try because failure to them is not an option. Failure is always an option. And in fact, uh, if you listen to any successful entrepreneur story, whether you like the person or not, they've always failed two to three times. And the reason why they're successful entrepreneurs is because everyone tries to be an entrepreneur at one time in their life or another. Everyone wants to try to make it on their own, and that's cool. But the real successful ones move past failure. They learn from their mistakes, and they keep going. The, not, the ones that we don't hear about, the, the ones working at accounting, the ones working at a church, or the ones working at wherever, that's fine. That's where God has them. But they failed once, and they said, I'm not going to try again, and they, and they went on to somewhere else. And maybe that's a God thing. But if you look at all the successful people that made it on their own, they failed multiple times. They learned from it. They changed. They improved. They critically thought their way out of that situation, and they went on to try again. And so, so that's important. So in your church volunteer team, teach critical thinking. Coach them through it. Ask, what are you struggling with right now? What can we learn from that lesson? Always, I always like to do a... Um, what we call an after action report. What went well yesterday? What didn't go well yesterday? What can we improve on? Me and Dave do this. Uh, what can we improve on that didn't go well? Let's make sure that it didn't happen again. And instead of you coming in demanding orders, hey, the lights went up. I need you not to hit the lights again. Come in. Why did the lights turn on in the middle of good, good father? Well, I, I bumped it. Okay. So what can we do to fix that? I don't know. Well, let's think about it. Why did they bump? Because you're reaching over to get a cable. Why were you reaching over to get a cable? Because I didn't know we needed this hookup for special music. Why didn't you need to know? Because they didn't know what special music was till the day before. So what do we need to do to fix that? We need to know what the special music is by Thursday. Okay. So let's put that into practice. Let's put that into process. And you start to teach them how to critically think and let them know that failure is okay. The great thing about Sunday is it's, first of all, it's free. So no one's going to be demanding a refund. <laughs> okay. No one paid for their concert tickets. So they won't be demanding a refund. Second, there's a lot of grace in the church. Maybe not as much as there should be, but there is grace. So show grace to your church volunteers and let them know we get to try again in, in a Sunday. And yeah, this might be a funny story, but 90% of the people are not going to remember or ever bring up again the time that you accidentally turn on the house lights during an intimate song in worship. Just, there's not going to happen on their mind. It's going to be on your mind. It's not going to be on their mind. So let's move past it. Let's keep going and let's be a better person because this happened, not a worse person. <laughs> one of the, one of the it things. Might not, it, might, it either won't get any clicks or it'll get all the clicks. <laughs> yeah. One of, um, one of the things that, as you were saying that, uh, it, it, it really occurred to me, Jesus let the disciples fail all the time. You know, oh, yeah. he, uh, he let, um, you know, he let the brothers fight over who was going to be first in the kingdom and, and you know, and, and then got it straight with them, you know. Um, and he let the he let 
let Peter chop off the guy's ear. And then he put the ear back on and he turned around to Peter and chastised him. You know, he he went and griped him out a little bit, you know, when he was praying in the garden and they fell asleep. And he let them fail. He let Peter come walking to him out on the water and let him start sinking um, and then realize that he had taken his focus off of the Lord. And then he, you know, picked him back up, you know. So failure is the best teacher in life. Um, and sometimes it's scary because your failures can be catastrophic. The good thing is, is that in a church environment, like you said, we do have, um, typically, uh, we operate under grace. I know at our church, if something goes wrong, our pastor is so unflappable. You know, he just says, you know, up, oh, looks like Satan's trying to mess with us. N- no one I mean, if anything, after a service, someone comes up and goes, you know, I saw this happen one time somewhere else. Have you looked at the, you know, and it's like, oh, well, that was it. You know what I'm saying? Um, so there is a lot of grace, you know, it, it you know, I don't, I don't know about a, a church that is like extremely production time driven where everything has to be perfect and, and they focus way too much on the aesthetics and the show versus the ministry. And here's the stuff to support the ministry. And if any of y'all's churches right. is, is like that, maybe you can help, you know, introduce grace. Right. And, and when I say grace, I, I really do mean grace after the fact. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't want to live a good enough ministry, right? There, there's an old phrase actually from my music degree I learned called good enough for jazz. And, you know, sometimes to the untrained ear, I have to say that my yes. degree makes me say that um, jazz sounds like a bunch of noise. Right. And you're, you're just kind of like, how is this music? And so there's a joke that says, are you playing the right note? I don't know. It's good enough for jazz because like it's jazz. You you just call it music no matter how bad it sounds. And so we don't want to live like, oh, it's okay. You know what? The light doesn't work this weekend. The half the one of the projectors doesn't work. That's okay. We'll get to it when we get to it. You know, we don't want to live like that. Okay. We understand there's situations where like, yeah, okay. I won't be able to get the projector this week. Okay. No sweat. You got family stuff. Go with it. We want we want to be excellent beforehand. You know, projector goes down on Friday. I'm going to do everything I can to either get myself or someone else there to fix it and replace the bulb on Saturday. So it's good to go by Sunday. Uh, but if the projector bulb goes out on Sunday and um, we can't find anyone that has the key to get it, and you know, we, it's just a time thing, and we just couldn't get it done. Okay, it's that happened. So how do we fix this later? We need to have the bulb in the booth, not in the music pastor's office that's locked under key when he's not available. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you critically think you show, I think you show the grace after the fact. Don't be too graceful before the fact, because then you become a good enough ministry. Right. You don't want that. You don't want to be like that. Um, If you ask anyone I've worked with, they will tell you how annoying I am about how much of a perfectionist I am trying to get things done uh, to the best of our ability that I know that we can do. Um, But if something doesn't happen afterwards, you know what? It happens. Let's move on. Let's fix it and make sure. Let's try not to do it again. Yeah. Uh, but let's 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 move on. Right. We know we can almost do it. Next week we'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ryan said he's been called on Monday on why this volunteer messed up. Um, yeah. That that'll happen. Yeah. Um, and that's your job as a leader to have your volunteers back yeah. and say, Hey, Miss June, I know the lights came on during Good Good Father. Hurt your eyes. I am so sorry. Um, we're working on, we're looking at a, why did it happen? B, how can we make sure it didn't happen again? Um, you know, we're, we're, we want you to be comfortable in worship and and I'm going to take care of it. Right. Right. And that's all you have to say. You don't even have to say who did it. Right. Uh, They know who did it. Just thanks for telling me about it. I appreciate you coming to me first and not spreading it around the church that so-and-so is not doing a good job. I appreciate you for being such a mature person about that. Rest assured, I will take care of this and, and make sure that it's addressed so we don't do it again because absolutely your experience in worship along with everyone else yep. is very important to us. So I don't take it lightly. So thank you so and so for telling me and let's let's uh and, let's get, and, get on it. And yeah. if if it does become an issue, just remind them that these are people who have volunteered to serve in the church. <laughs> Failure is not a bad thing. And that's one of the things that Justin talks about is that failure is a um, we, we're almost programmed um, that failure is is a really bad thing. But the reality is, 
is that nobody gets it right the first time in general. Sometimes there are people, you had those kids in school, you know, that got it right the first time that seemed to anything they touched, you know, just blossomed and, you know, sun radiated out of their belly buttons and stuff. But the reality is that generally speaking, for anything that you do, you're not going to get it right the first time. You're not going to get it perfect, okay? And I think that's a key point to what Justin is saying is that you you need to be okay in yourself with failing, okay? Now, as an entrepreneur, Justin and I, uh, and we mentioned this a little bit uh, back there, as entrepreneurs, we kind of expect to fail. We don't want to fail, and we don't want to lose a ton of money, right? But we kind of expect to fail. And if we go into doing things knowing that, hey, this may not work out, and the moment things stop working out and something just miserably falls apart, being able to dissect what it was, where, where, what, what did we miss? You know, were we targeting the wrong uh, people, the wrong demographics, say in our advertising, a Facebook ad or something? You know, were we targeting, um, were we targeting pastors um, with uh, church training academy, where we should be targeting uh, people that are like worship pastors, because the worship pastor usually has more to do with the media and the communications than the lead pastor does, right? Okay, well. So if we spent $1,000 on Facebook ads and got hardly any response, whatever, because we were targeting people with a job title of preacher and pastor, we failed. If we'd have done worship minister and media minister and digital pastor, and now we would... So you see what I'm saying? So we failed, but we learned. And then now the next time we do an ad or something, we would be getting the right people. So it's the same across anything, whether whether it's in your, your ads at church, if you're, you know, targeting ads in your area to have people come to an event or something, or whether it's like Justin said, you know, not paying attention, all of a sudden it's 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 a somber moment in the worship and you bring up all the house lights and all that, you know, or you get somebody gets feedback or something, whatever. The thing is, is that we have to make sure that um, the people around us know that we don't expect them to be perfect. That's okay. We don't we don't expect them to be perfect. We frankly don't want them to be perfect because we're not perfect, and they would really get annoying if they were always perfect. That's kind of a reality there. Um, it's okay to fail. Learn from it, and let's fix it. And like he said, if you have someone who's consistently failing at something, it's not because they're a failure. You need to be looking at maybe they need to be doing something that is more um, in, their, in their strength side. They're doing this job maybe. They've taken on this responsibility because there's an opening and no one was filling it. So they jumped in and did it. When we were talking with Danny Franks, uh, one of the things that he said that they do is they try to um, identify where the person's strengths is and put them in the place. That lessens the chance of their failure and stuff. But anyway, the overall that we're trying to get at here is that failure is an option. And if you're going to fail, we've learned this in business. Uh, programmers learn this. Startups learn this. If you're going to fail, fail fast, fix it, and move on. It is a cultural thing. It is a societal thing. And it's something that I guess really starts with us this point forward, right? So if you're leading your ministry team, take some of these thoughts into consideration and make them, um, take them to heart, okay? Uh, and teach them, okay? Build that culture with the people on your team. If you're a pastor, if you're church staff, if you're a department head or whatever, Take these these ideas here and let the people know, yeah, we want everything to be perfect. But like we said, the reality is no one's going to remember and and be, you know, no one's going to go fleeing from your church because you stooped over and, um, you know, accidentally hit the wrong button on the console and all the lights came up when everybody was praying. I mean, if people are leaving because of something like that, the reasons that they're at your church are not the right reasons. And if that sounds harsh, I'm sorry. That's kind of it. They're not focused on the right things. So I want to thank Justin for um, for kind of sharing his shower conversation with us um, in our mastermind. Um, a lot of really deep thoughts. And, and I admit the same thing. I think and talk to myself in the shower. You know, if the girls are around and stuff, I don't want them to hear me in there, you know, talking to myself and stuff. But I mouth things and I work things out in my head. Uh, I, I'm going to do that when no one's around in here. Um, I'm kind of doing it right now on camera. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, thanks, Justin, for uh, for those thoughts and uh, for helping us 
uh, move move that that mind shift a little bit into uh, it's okay to fail. Um, it's definitely poignant, um, you know. And that happened actually, guys. Like I said earlier, in our mastermind, our group coaching session, which involves our CTA insiders. So if you join Church Training Academy, that's one of the things that you get to do is you get to hang out with me and Justin and Ryan and Jordan and Tommy and Chris and Christopher and all of us, the whole mess of us that come in um, every couple of weeks and help each other. I mean, that's that I can't I can't stress how useful that is. It, it's really cool. Dawn said in uh, in the chat earlier. Uh, what about when you're a one-man band, you know, a one-person show? Um, you know, in her case, she's the pastor, she's the um, everything, right? Well, Church Media Academy, Church Media Academy, Church Training Academy is there for her. She's not alone, okay? And she knows she's not alone. She can always jump into the private CTA Insiders page and ask a question. And we all start working on trying to get it fixed for her. Help her out, right? Um, that's why... You guys who are not CTA insiders can get some of this help in the Church Media Hacks group. So anyway, it's important to surround yourself with a team of people who just genuinely want to help. And that's what we're doing with Church Training Academy. So go to churchtrainingacademy.com slash join and see what's going on. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for contributing. Um, thank you for uh, your insights in the chat. It's been great. Uh, love all you guys. Take what you've learned today and go change lives.